Thank you very much. OK, it's a real pleasure to be um, to be invited to present here this morning. Um, I'm going to give you um, a little presentation on something that's it's, um, slightly different, and it's an overview really on Vibrios, which is the bacteria that I work on. There's a real um, drive for me to um, to present this kind of work in a, um, a an Earth Observation Remote Sensing Forum, because I think these are um, a really great example of uh, bacteria that are going to become more important in the future and where those sorts of methods that uh, you've already seen some of uh, already, uh, uh, genomics, remote sensing, etc., are going to become more important in the future. So what are Vibrio? So these are bacteria that are commonly found in coastal waters around the world. These are naturally occurring microbes. They're globally important pathogens in seafood and um, in, in water. And there's about actually about a dozen or more um, species that can cause infections in humans. The most important, um, Nick just presented just now on uh, Vibrio cholerae, um, but there's also Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parahematicus, and those are a, a significant cause of human disease around the world. Uh, this picture on the right hand side, um, you can see this, this horrible wound infection. This was um, a man in Japan who was um, who cut the back of his hand um, looking for shrimp in a, in a fish market and he got a necrotizing wound infection and unfortunately died. So this sort of example shows that these are really potent human pathogens that can cause really devastating diseases. Um, we know that water and shellfish are important vehicles for a range of different human pathogens. We've known about this for um, over 200 years. The classic example is cholera that Nick uh, just mentioned, but there are other pathogens as well that are transmitted very effectively through this medium into human populations. And, and there's, a, there's a big area of global science around studying these types of pathogens. So um, the th I'd say the real reason why Vibrios are on the rise and why we're going to have significant problems in the future is because of climate change. So these bacteria grow preferentially in low salinity water. Their growth and abundance is proportional to ambient environmental temperatures. And this rapid warming of marine and coastal systems around the world and to the point where these types of bacteria, we're now calling them a barometer of climate change. Um, this figure top right here that you can see, this is from um, an estuary in the United States and it shows the relative abundance of total vibrios in the water column compared to ambient temperatures. And you can see during the, the summer, they proliferate very rapidly and then they, they die off in the, in the autumn. And then when the water temperatures increase again, they rapidly increase again. And that's the seasonal cycle that we see with pathogenic vibrios. I'm gonna show you something that's actually somewhat terrifying. This is um, data that's just literally um, a few days old. This is global sea surface temperature data from around the world from 60 degrees south to 60 degrees north, so the whole global uh, picture. This is remote sensing derived sea surface temperatures, and it goes back from um, late 1981 all the way through to 2023. And the orange line that you can see here at the top is 2023. So from March onwards, uh, we exceeded the highest temperatures that have ever been globally reported, and those temperatures have not come down since. Um, so they've continued. You can see actually the difference between 2023 and the long term mean 1982 to 2011, which is in this data set. And it, it is several uh, standard deviations higher than it should be. So um, this is also continued into 2024, but it gives you an idea about what's currently happening at the moment. Something very unusual with regards to warming has, has occurred in the last year, and that's going to have global ramifications for infectious diseases, I think. So why are we worried? Well, Cases associated with these bacteria moving northwards with climate warming um, and southwards as well in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, infections and outbreaks are now reported in many different temperate areas. Uh, wound cases predominate in Europe. And there's also very interesting issues with regards to demographics and epidemiology. So there's an increase in at-risk groups. Those people are more likely to get systemic Vibrio infections, more invasive Vibrio infections like that. A wound infection I showed you on the first slide. This is data on the right hand side here, remote sensing derived data um, from the Vibria risk portal, um, which shows during a heat wave in the Baltic Sea. This is one of the hot spots globally for these bacteria at the moment. It's a big body of low salinity water. It warms very rapidly during heat wave um, events. And um, there's a lot of people then that go swimming in the sea. So you have this 
um, th th this in incredible situation where the one time of the year when these bacteria are actively proliferating to high concentrations is the one time that people go into get into contact with them. So it's an interesting uh, interaction between human behaviour and between um, microbiology uh, and, and other risk factors. So how bad can things get? This is what we're really worried about at the moment. There's these um, different hot spots that are emerging around the world. This is a study from a collaborator of mine, Jaime Martinez um, from Barcelona, um, and that looked at projections for coastal warming around the world by the end of the century. It shows that these types of pathogenic bacteria are going to emerge um, not everywhere and all at the same rate, but in different hotspots. So the Baltic Sea will be one, the Black Sea, the northeast coast of the United States, parts of Canada, parts of Southeast Asia as well. So there's going to be hotspots of disease emergence in the future. So um, what's happening in Europe is actually really interesting. Extreme weather events such as heat waves have increased um, in both their severity and impact in response to climate warming. So heat wave events that we would have experienced perhaps twice a century in the early 2000s, those are now happening twice a decade. Until the mid 2000s, Vibrio infections in Europe were very rare um, and sporadic to the point actually where they were normally reported in medical journals. In the last decade, that's changed significantly. So from 2014 to 2018, there's more than a thousand cases of vibriosis reported in Northern Europe alone. Um, from 2010 to 2018, there were 600 infections reported in Denmark. So it gives you an idea about how the, the clinical manifestation of these kinds of pathogens has changed markedly uh, in a very short space of time. And there's lots of papers now that have been published that show the, the, this, this kind of thing happening. Um, so what we've been involved in with collaborators, in particular with, with Jaime uh, and, and a few other collaborators around the world, we've, we've helped lead some international efforts to develop some of the tools that you can use to study these bacteria in detail. Um, Nick showed a very good example of how you can try and integrate what are traditionally viewed as sort of disparate scientific disciplines, things like uh, genomics, and remote sensing. Um, I think remote sensing it, it offers some incredible um, opportunities to look at how risks are changing and um, they're really critical for risk assessment purposes as well. Um, and the ability to be able to combine these two different types of data sets together, I think, is, is, is where the, the sort of sweet spot will be in terms of studying these bacteria in the future. This example on the uh, top right hand side is from an outbreak that took place in the United States and in Europe and, um, and how those strains could be analysed. And then the bottom here is using our sort of risk portal that we helped develop. Um, it looks at temperature and salinity. I'll show you a, an example. This is from, um, from Jaime, um, something that we've, we've never published, but this is from an outbreak in the United States uh, in 1997. This is one of the largest ever foodborne outbreaks reported in the States. 209 infections, but you can actually see this body of warm water moving along the coastline of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then those cases, those infections being reported in both time and space. And I think it demonstrates the sort of utility of risk assessment methods for risk prediction purposes. And actually, when we've retrospectively looked at outbreaks, you do get this clear environmental signal um, often, which is high temperatures, low salinity, and those are driven by things such as heat wave events. Now, I think the, the big limitation, this has been alluded to in some of the other presentations in this session, but there's a huge data gap in high quality epidemiological data, and that's missing in many parts of the world. So a key aspiration of mine is to try and establish a means of gathering data more effectively for these types of bacteria. Um, and that's potentially using um, focal points in different regions. Now, we're actually fortunate that in the States, they have a very, very good system in place to do this. And it's been in place for um, nearly 40 years now. It's called COVIS. It's called the Cholera and Other Vibrio Information Service. It's a service that's provided by the CDC in Atlanta. And we could potentially use that approach as a blueprint to gather data. But what we do need in the interim is international collaborations. So we need to be able to share data between different countries, between different regions. And I don't think we're doing enough of that as it stands. So thank you very much for listening. I realize I've only got 10 minutes, so I wasn't going to include all of my people I collaborate with, um, but I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you very much.